Thank you everyone for joining us today. This is the Valley Metro Capital Extension Light Rail and City of Phoenix Transit Oriented Communities Project Virtual Public Meeting. We appreciate you guys making time to join us today. Just a reminder that this meeting will be recorded. Uh, all participants have been muted to avoid background noise. Following the presentation, we will be taking comments and questions provided online and by phone. We'll provide instructions at the end of the presentation. To turn on closed captioning, select the option from the menu. If you're having any audio or technical issues today, you can call the number on your screen or contact WebEx support at 866-229-3239. We are providing simultaneous Spanish language interpretation. There may be additional pauses throughout the broadcast. If you need to join the Spanish language channel, please take a look at the information on your screen. You'll need to call in with a separate line like your phone and then mute this broadcast to listen to the simultaneous Spanish interpretation. Today we'll be going over the capital extension and talk about a project update for the light rail. We'll also go over the environmental design, welcome our design advancement teams, and talk about what's next for Valley Metro Public Art on the Capital Extension. Then we'll go over what the next steps are for the project. After that, the City of Phoenix will come on and talk about transit-oriented communities in the Capital District. But before we get started, I'd like to welcome Marcus Coleman, the City of Phoenix Light Rail Administrator, to give us a couple words. Marcus? Thank you, Jessica. Um, we're really excited to have everyone here uh, virtually. Um, I know that Jessica has already stated about uh, the translation. So as we go through these presentations, it may seem as if we're speaking a little slowly, um, but that's because we definitely want to make sure we give time for translation for everyone to be able to participate. Um, I first want to thank you for giving us your time to be here with us today. We have a lot of information that we would like to share with you, not only regarding the project itself, but the surrounding area of the project. It's important to the city of Phoenix, it's important to Valley Metro um, and all of our electics, our mayor and council, um, that not only these projects be done with an effort to look at the investment of transportation in the area, but look at all the ways that uh, new development and existing development within the area can benefit from these types of investment and having uh, these type of uh, high capacity transit options nearby. And so you'll hear from uh, great team members today about the project. Um, and other great team members that will speak to you about the potentials of the development of the surrounding areas and what the future of those surrounding areas look like. And so I, I really want to take a moment just to show my gratitude and appreciation um, for you joining us today. And so with that, um, I will turn it over to Tommy Santana, who will walk us through the first portion of the presentation. Uh, thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Marcus. So, uh, on the uh, project itself, I am the project manager for Valley Metro. Uh, as Marcus stated, my name is Tony Santana. So, I'll be the project manager from the design phase all the way through construction until we have our revenue service. Um, today, we'll um, not only me from the project will be speaking, uh, Marcus just introduced himself, but we'll also have Jessica Parks, who um, was just covering the opening. We'll cover some artwork and then we'll pass it over to our city of Phoenix folks to talk about the TLC program. Diving into the uh, project update. This next slide to pop up here. Um, when we last met, uh, since we last met, the uh, governor has signed in SB 1102 
which uh, has restrictions on the previous alignment that went to 19th Avenue. There is now a, a boundary around between 17th Avenue and 18th Avenue between Adams and Jefferson in and around the state capital area that we cannot build light rail in that area. So with that being said, um, the project was impacted uh, due to, on the alignment and we had to update that alignment and we'll see that here on the um, on the next slide. <clears throat> So due to that restriction around the state capital area, we are now looping around at, we're gonna have our loop at 15th Avenue uh, between Washington and Jefferson instead of the 19th Avenue between Adams and Jefferson. So for the project itself, we are still tying in to when South Central project is open here in 2025, we'll be tying in at 3rd Avenue in Washington and Jefferson, um, we will head on Washington, we will be heading westbound until we intercept one of our first stations, which we have two stations on this project. And our first station platform is actually on 7th Avenue in Washington, just west of 7th Avenue. As you continue westbound on Washington, um, we'll have our second, our second station, which is on 15th Avenue. The first platform is on 15th Avenue in Washington. Um, and as we make that loop around, uh, we will have our second our um, our third platform, which would be on 15th Avenue um, in Jefferson. And then we'll head back to downtown on Jefferson um, and we'll have our last or fourth platform there on uh, just east of 7th Avenue and Jefferson. Um, so there's no major updates there um, beyond the, the, the tie-in point. I will mention that between 3rd Avenue and 10th Avenue, we will be side running. Um, on both Washington and Jefferson. So on Washington, we'll be on the north side of the roadway. And then on Jefferson, we'll be on the south side of the roadway. So, and then between 10th and 15th Avenue, we'll be in the center of the roadway. Um, <clears throat> the, another adjustment we had is the, there was a station on, seven, on 17th Avenue when we were extending the 19th. We now have relocated that to 15th Avenue to better serve the modified loop. And still, we're not really going, it, into the capital area, but we're on the front door or the front lawn of the capital area. Um, and then as we progress our design, we're, we're working on design refinements. So that will be detailing uh, driveways and uh, specific roadway updates and, and things like that. So we'll, we'll keep you guys updated as we progress and refine uh, the design. <clears throat> Next the. With this project, uh, we do have a federal funding component. Um, and with that being said, we do have to follow the environmental uh, process. And we are actually um, starting that process. We started that process this month. If you wanna hit the next slide here. <clears throat> As part of that pro process, we have to evaluate different categories. Um, and you can see here on this slide, there's quite a few categories that we have to evaluate as part of this environmental process that we started this month. Uh, a few of those major items that a lot of folks have interest in are taking a close look at the noise and vibration impacts, traffic impacts, and visual impacts within the alignment. Um, but as you can see, like I said, there's a lot of other categories to evaluate and all of these uh, evaluations will be uh, shared with the public. <clears throat> In addition to the environmental process, we have the, uh, this is a, we have to follow the section 106 uh, of the National Historic Preservation Act. And some of the bullets here is just outreach with the stakeholder, um, looking at the possible impacts to the historic resources, and then consulting with all parties um, involved with this process. <clears throat> Now I can, I wanna quickly introduce as we're progressing to design and you'll see them at future public meetings, I wanna introduce our design team. So our first team, our designers are uh, Jacobs Engineering. They are the civil design team. So when we say civil design, those are the folks that you will be coordinating with you on designs for your roadway, ADA access, um, utilities. So all of the civil infrastructure on the project. 
The second design team that we have is uh, PGH Wong Engineering. They focus on the systems components. So their focus is on how we get power to the train, communication for the train, um, all of the overhead and catenary uh, wires that you see on the project. It's, it's all focused on just electrical and power for the training communication on the systems component of the project. And with that, I'll pass it over to Jessica to cover public art. Thank you, Tony. So my favorite part of the, pro of the project includes the CapEx art development. Valley Metro has a very, uh, very cool program called Arts Line that you know uh, will mer uh, focus on emerging and experienced artists for our light rail construction. In this case, Capital Extension has four station platform projects, uh, one traction power substation project, and one operator facility project, as well as three railing projects that they will be selecting artists for. Uh, that call for artists opened on April 1st and is due to close June 5th. So if you have any local artists or um, people in the area that you feel can help create thoughtful, engaging artwork that will help reflect the character of the Capital District, please encourage them to go seek out valleymetro.org slash artsline. We will also be asking for additional community involvement with the selection of those artists and the artwork review. So if you were at our last meeting, you heard me talk about the stakeholder art review committee and the Valley Metro Regional Rail Art Committee. These committees are composed of Valley Metro and our uh, community members in the Capital District to dis uh, that will help guide the art development in the area. Designs will also be on display at valleymetro.org slash artsline when they're available. Now, what is next for the capital extension project? Uh, as Tony mentioned before, we are going to be starting in the environmental process uh, right now, spring 2024. We'll also continue to refine the design over the winter with the feedback that we receive, both from the public and our partners, uh, through the winter and then into spring 2025, when we'll reach out again to talk about additional um, elements of the design and how it's progressed based on community feedback. So how can you help? Well, we need your input. Uh, please visit the website at bellymetro.org slash capex, and you can fill out the comment form anytime before June 7th. We'll go ahead and drop that link in the chat as well. You can also sign up for future project updates and update your contact information uh, at the website. Now with that, I'm pleased to, uh, I'm pleased to introduce Nick Klemek. He is the Transit Oriented Communities Planner for the City of Phoenix, and he's going to take us through the Capital District Transit Oriented Communities Project. Nick? Thank you, Jessica. My name is Nick Klemek, and I'm the project manager for the city of Phoenix uh, for the Capital District Transit Oriented Community Plan. Today is exciting because we have the rare opportunity to plan for both the physical extension of the light rail, that is 30% design, and also the community's vision for its future, and that is the Transit Oriented Community Plan. The city of Phoenix received a grant from the United States Department of Transportation to develop transit-oriented community plans around the Capital Extension and the I-10 West light rail extensions. These plans will help guide, attract, and prioritize investments in infrastructure, housing, economic development, and other areas to realize a shared vision for the future. And that's where you all come in. We need your help to establish what that vision is that we're trying to achieve through this planning effort. We've, we have assembled a strong team from the city of Phoenix, and we've also hired our Dura group and their team of subject matter experts to help develop these plans. Moving forward, you'll have a chance to work side by side with this dynamic team of professionals that includes urban designers, land use experts, housing specialists, and many more. So I'd like to now provide an overview on this type of planning initiative 
why we do it and what you can expect from it moving forward. So what are transit oriented communities? Well, they're compact, they're walkable neighborhoods centered around providing equitable access to transit and transportation. Frankly, it's easier to show than to tell. It's really a time tested way of building cities and can be found in many of the places that we love, both in the United States and abroad. Looking at these three examples, you can see some of the key principles that permeate the concept. Buildings are close to the sidewalk and embrace the public street. Neighborhoods and often individual buildings contain a mix of complementary uses and destinations. The sidewalks are treated as an intentional place that's shaded, welcoming, and alive from the adjacent land uses, such as outdoor dining. A bit on definitions. A transit-oriented community, or as we call it sometimes, TOCs, uh, is one that's anchored by transit-oriented developments. When I have to describe this, transit-oriented development can be singular. It can be one project, it can be one property. A transit-oriented community can be a combination of properties that are nestled into an existing uh, neighborhood that thus makes it transit-oriented as a community. When you, when you look at a transit-oriented community, you'll likely see the highest intensity located right around the transit station. That is tallest building heights, uh, most intense uses, and then lower intensity uses and uh, building forms radiating outward from that. The purpose of these planning efforts is to channel the transformative investment in high capacity transit toward uplifting the community as a whole. We know this public investment is going to beget both more public investment and more private investment. So this plan is an opportunity to guide how and where that goes moving forward. As I said, transit-oriented communities, it's reminiscent of a time-tested way of building cities. We, we focus on the people, we focus on the places that we, we want to create and the way that we want to live our lives. And light, so light rail, when coupled with supportive community policies, allow the people and places to benefit from improved access to transportation, housing, education, jobs, services, and entertainment, while also being safer, both in terms of transportation network uh, and community, um, while also reaping benefits related to sustainability and affordability. So how do we plan transit-oriented communities? Uh, it's a big topic, and this is a big study area. So I'll answer with two pieces. The first is with you, with the people who know this community best. And the second is holistically through what we call our six planning elements. The first of which is land use, and that's about where things go and what they look like. The second, mobility, the movement of people and goods. Economic development, that's financial prosperity of businesses and re residents, including generational wealth creation. Housing, which is going to be an emphasis of this plan, is about where and how people live, how affordability impacts different housing products and different households. Health is about how the built environment impacts quality of life uh, and health outcomes. Green systems is about improving the natural and human environments as they intersect to form our habitat. Okay, so back to the grants. I mentioned there are, I mentioned the capital and I mentioned the uh, I-10 West study areas. Looking at the capital district, 
we're looking at everywhere from 7th Avenue on the east over to I-17 on the west, I-10 on the north, down to the Union Pacific Railroad on the south. So a fairly large study area and one that we we think can can entirely benefit from uh, thoughtful, transit oriented and walkable uh, community principles. The second part of the project or the sister project is about the I-10 West transit oriented community study area. So that is everything from I-17 on the east out to 83rd Avenue on the west, Van Buren Street on the south up to Encanto Boulevard on the north, and then uh, shooting up toward Desert Sky Mall on the west. So as I said, this is a big area between these two plans. So how do we do it? How do we approach this problem, this challenge, this opportunity? Well, we ask three rhetorical questions. The first is who we are. What, what's happening in the area today? What are the assets? What are the opportunities? And what are the challenges? Second, we ask what we want. And we is you. What's the vision that you all want for the future? That's five, ten, five, 10, 15, 20 years into the future. Are there big ideas? Are there crazy ideas that we might be able to entertain or dream about in this process? Uh, we want to hear it all and we want to be able to uh, steal that from what we're, what we're hearing from and what we're dreaming up with the community. And then finally, phase three, how do we get there? It's okay and heck essential to dream uh, 20 years into the future. But we must implement in a much shorter time frame, one, three, five years. So that is the implementation strategy that is necessary to ensure that the vision uh, that you all want is ultimately attainable. Okay, so how to engage moving forward. There are going to be so many meetings over the next 12 months. Uh, that's how long we're gonna be working on this planning effort. Uh, and we want, to, we want to get to know as many people in this area, as many organizations as we can, and we want to learn as much as we possibly can from you all. If there are, oh, uh, So if, if there are places where community happens, where people gather, uh, where, um, or organizations that we should know about, uh, please invite us, tell us about them, and we'll be there. We, we want to engage. Um, and that is beginning yesterday, or no, Saturday, uh, and having five sessions later this week. So there are two sessions on, on Tuesday, two sessions on Wednesday, and one session on Saturday uh, morning that are up on the screen right now. Um, those, will be, those will be focused on transit-oriented communities, and you'll be able to get into much more detail into these concepts, into your neighborhoods uh, at those workshops. Finally, Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you for being part of this meeting. Uh, really looking forward to getting to know you all, getting to know this community, uh, and talking about transit-oriented community and just what's possible. Thank you so much. My email's on the screen, so feel free to reach out, uh, or we'll connect later this week. Thank you all. Thank you, Nick. We're going to enter into our question and answer portion of today's virtual meeting. So I know that was uh, quite a bit of information between the capital extension and the transit oriented communities. So if you have questions, there's a couple different ways that you can ask them. One is verbally. If you want to raise your hand, uh, you can do that a couple of ways. If you're listening to us online through via the WebEx app, 
or the mobile app, you're going to find the participant panel or the three dot menu icon. Raise your hand with the raise hand icon. And then once you're done asking your question, please lower it. You can also ask a question via the Q&A panel on your screen. So you can open the Q&A panel, uh, enter your question and hit send. If you're on mobile, the three dot menu icon will have the Q&A panel in there as well. All right, so I'm gonna pull up my list of attendees and I'm looking for any raised hands or questions in the Q&A. But for now, um, let me have my, if, if, okay, I do have Tony and Nick available. Uh, first question I have from Alita. How will the route around the capital be determined? On the map, it says option one and option two. I think that question is for Tony and maybe Marcus Coleman, if you would mind turning your camera on as well. Yeah, I can answer that. So <clears throat> option one and option two are actually a part of the I-10 West extension project, and we are currently in the process of trying to schedule a public meeting to get input for which option we are going to go with for that future extension. But as part of this project, that is not a decision being made with the capital extension, but it will be made with that I-10 um, West extension, which we hopefully will get a meeting scheduled and get input for that soon. Thank you, Tony. Uh, in the Q and A, what is the difference between today and a planning session? Jessica, I assume that question's for me. Um, I I'll think so. Stab, I'll take a stab at it. Okay, so I would say today uh, we're looking to get information out. We're looking to solicit some questions, some clarifications from you all. Uh, it's this is very much the start of the conversation about transit oriented communities and an opportunity for us to help bring you up to speed on the 30% design plans, the planning workshops, the planning sessions that are going to be coming up uh, later this week. Um, those are going to dig into bigger questions about, you know, what, what is your experience living in this area? What. Uh, opportunities, challenges do you see, do you experience on a daily basis? And where would you like, uh, how would you like the city of Phoenix, yourself and the private market to help uh, respond to those conditions? So it'll be, uh, I, I think more of the meat of the conversation um, rather than this, which I would call something of an appetizer. Okay, we have a raised hand and I see Cynthia. I'm going to uh, request that you unmute so you can ask your question verbally. Um, question for you in regards to the, the new extension. Uh, will you be incorporating turnstiles with the new extension? Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, no, we will not on this project. And that's to stay consistent with uh, throughout our alignment. Let me add a little more um, to that. <laughs> um, when we look at our system and we look at hardening our system or making it a closed system, that's something that's been uh, asked over the years several times since um, 2008 when we went into service. Um, there's several things. If you notice most uh, light rail systems throughout the country um, that are, are running at grade, uh, running at grade means they're at surface level, um, street level. Um, there's not, they're not a subsurface like a subway or they're not elevated. Um, they're open systems. Um, it's very, uh, tech, from a technical standpoint, um, it's doable, but it takes a lot of infrastructure in order um, to make a system a closed system when it's at grade, um, especially to retrofit a system. Not only that, um, there's we don't have the ability to um, make certain portions of the system, what we would call a closed system. We would have to do um, those retrofit to the entire system. Um, we have uh, federal requirements 
um, that make sure that the amenities that we have um, through our system are consistent no matter where you are, you know, and that's something that not only through the federal requirements, but just as an agency such as Valley Metro and City of Phoenix being a member city, we want to make sure that we're giving that same level of quality and quality of service to all of our residents and all of our patrons of our system, no matter where they're located as they you know, utilize our system and, and go through our operations. And so um, that's something that we are not looking at. However, we are working with um, Valley Metro's Allied Universal Security Team, as well as our Phoenix uh, Police Department and our Transit Unit, um, to look at ways that we can not only enhance um, security um, around our light rail corridors, but then also bringing on other resources such as the customer experience coordinators who have not so much of a security aspect to them, but another visual aspect of having a presence on our system and being able to almost act as ambassadors along our system and, and proactively address concerns as they are, are witnessed or brought up. So I'm, I'm hoping that provides adequate information for that question. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, Corey is asking in the Q&A, Will legislation restricting light rail proximity to the state capital affect TOD and TOC in that area? Thank you, Jessica. Um, I think the answer is both yes and no. Uh, the answer related to the physical alignment and the location of where light rail will go, uh, that's yes. Um, that's why we're modified. That's why we modified the alignment uh, for this overall area. What we're looking at in terms of transit oriented development, transit oriented communities is the broader, the broader network, the broader community as a whole. Um, and how we, and I, and I would say the, the biggest implication is the last mile or the last quarter mile. Uh, we want to be able to get people as effectively between the neighborhoods and the employers as we can, uh, but also light rail. Um, so we may need some additional connectivity. We may need some enhancements uh, to the built environment, uh, but our study area for the transit oriented community plan has not changed. Thank you, Nick. All right. Will the light rail traffic be prioritized over vehicular traffic to make them faster at these extensions? Vehicle prioritization is unfortunately making the light rail a much slower alternative. Yeah, so <clears throat> right now we're currently designing, um, as you would see on our existing system. However, what this part of the proce process with this project, as I mentioned, is looking at traffic impacts, not just to the vehicle traffic, but um, reliability for the train itself. And, and, I, and I think, and I know our design team, uh, that's something we stressed out stressed a lot on on our selection process of our design advancement team to look at maximizing efficiency for all modes of transportation in this area so that be vehicles light rail or pedestrian so that is something that's a focus not just on this project but also throughout working with city of phoenix tempe and mesa to make uh, the light rail ride more efficient and i think i could pass it to marcus to touch on that a little bit more <clears throat> Yes, thank you, Tony. I think that was a great answer as far as where we're looking at from the project standpoint. Um, as we look at operations as a whole, um, City of Phoenix being one of the member cities of the Valley Metro Rail, um, we have started to have those internal conversations and discussions uh, around signal uh, preemption and prioritization for rail. Um, that's something that we're pretty, uh, we're in the infant stages of those conversations. You know that this is something that we've talked about uh, for quite some time of wanting to start to do some investigation. And so as part of some of the operational efficiencies that Valley Metro is looking through right now, um, that will be one of the things that is also uh, reviewed by a consultant team is to, to look at what technologies uh, would be required, what agreements would be required, what those impacts would be to each of the individual cities. And then once we have all that information, um, then the cities will uh, be able to uh, collectively uh, make a decision to, together on how that uh, functions for operational. So that's something that 
Um, I wouldn't say I know that the capital extension is going to be looking at those impacts as, as we develop the project, um, but this is something that uh, will probably take place outside of that project well before um, this project is into revenue service. We'll be doing those evaluations at, um, before then. Thank you, Marcus. Leticia is asking, uh, what should we as community members be aware of in terms of crime mitigation as you think through the transit options? I've read some pieces on transit stations slash parking seeing an increase in crime. How have you been learning from previous phases and addressing this issue? So I will talk about some of the operational pieces of it and then Tony, if you could talk about the project pieces of it, I know you go through fairly uh, lots of detail on, on what's being done to make sure that we have safe projects. So I don't want to steal any of that thunder. Um, as far as the uh, project that the system that we currently have in operations, uh, we work very closely Phoenix, city of Phoenix, city of Tempe, city of Mesa with Valley Metro. Um, as I stated in my earlier uh, comment, um, not only does Valley Metro have Allied Universal Security, um, who's the contract um, security company um, that provides um, uh, code enforcement for code of conduct and also fair um, collection um, review and inspections. Um, then we also have what is called the customer experience coordinators will act as another set of eyes along the alignment. And then each of the cities, uh, we engage with our police departments, whether it be in city of Phoenix, we actually have a transit unit, um, but the city of Tempe and city of Mesa um, also engage with their police departments respectively for each of those areas. And um, it's really about looking at new and improved ways of uh, showing that presence on rail. Um, we know that here in the city of Phoenix, and I'm just going to be very specific with this answer to Phoenix, um, we are down considerable amount of uh, number of officers. Uh, we have a, a large vacancy in our police force. However, we have been working very closely um, with our police department to come up with um, alternative programs. Right now, we have a program to where officers that are graduating from the academy and have the ability to do solo rides, um, that their first two weeks out of the academy, they are actually responding to and being proactive um, to having a presence on our light rail. It does a few things for us. It allows for those new officers um, to not only engage with the community and get more uh, practice with engaging with the community, but one of the things that we look at with our transit and throughout the city of Phoenix as a whole, but um, we definitely push it in our transit uh, environment is to lead with services. And so this also helps our uh, new officers to have that regular interaction with some of our um, service providers for social services and knows how those uh, social services work, knows the, uh, help them to become familiar with the appropriate uh, contact individuals um, from those uh, social services and how to identify and respond. And so um, those are some of the things that we're doing um, on the city of Phoenix side. I know in Tempe, they actually have some of their downtown bicycle patrol that'll actually get on um, the trains as they um, also patrol the ASU campus. They'll get on the trains as well and show presence on those platforms and stations. And then Mesa also has uh, police officers that will not only respond, but also ride uh, rail within their jurisdiction as well. And then from a project standpoint, I'll hand it over to Tony to talk about all the, the myriad of things that are done from the project standpoint. Yeah, thank you, Marcus. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so from a project standpoint, um, even in the preliminary phases as design and construction progresses, we are always thinking about safety and security of our project. Uh, this is also a federally funded project, as we mentioned. So with the part as part of a federally funded project, we work with the state safety oversight from uh, Arizona Department of Transportation and the federal government to make sure we're complying with all the safety and security issues on the project. Um, and, and now that we have the design team, we also are going to quickly um, gather information to go ahead and do a what it's called a threat and vulnerability assessment of the project. So looking at potential threats and vulnerability areas on the project and see how we can design um, to mitigate some of those concerns. Um, and then lastly, we when we're designing, we always are thinking about these safety and security issues by designing with uh, 
some of you heard the term SEPTED, which is crime prevention through environmental design. And we definitely have that on our mind as we design our system. Thank you, Tony and Marcus. Uh, just a reminder that we do have some additional time for questions. So if you would like to raise your hand and ask your question verbally, there's a couple of different ways to do that via WebEx. Uh, again, just try and find the raise hand icon and I'll make sure to unmute you. Or you can feel free to please go ahead and put your comment in the Q&A portion and we'll get to it and read it out loud. All right, from David, uh, there are rumors of bike lane removal on Washington Street and Jefferson Street. Why should we make this area more car centric as we built light rail? Marcus, you want me to go first? <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so, be, so right now we um, the project design as is, and I wish we had the roll plot to show here, which we talked a lot about on Saturday as we had our roll plot out. But between um, Third and Tenth Avenue on Washington and Jer Jefferson, we do want to we will have a bike lane, but it's a share row. And then between Tenth and Fifteenth Avenue, we will have a dedicated bike lane. Um, on Washington and Jefferson, so there is bike lane access. It's just going to be a combination of Shero and the um, and and dedicated bike lane. But also, I would pass it to Marcus because the city of Phoenix is also working as part of the T twenty fifty plan on looking at opportunities for um, bike uh, bike path potential projects. Tony, yes, thank you for giving me that segue. Um, we are definitely looking as as part of our T2050, which is a voter approved um, uh, transit tax. Uh, part of that was a promise to increase the amount of bike lanes that we have and to look at our bike uh, system, our bike path system as a whole. Um, projects like our South Central project and our Capital Extension project, as well as Northwest Extension Phase 2. Um, those projects we coordinate with our street transportation department um, to make sure that we have connectivity to existing bike paths and then wherever possible that we are able to incorporate and increase bike paths. Um, I know that for the capital extension, our design as we move forward, our design is really going to determine the, the type and the level of bike path that we have. We'll always make sure that we have accommodations for, um, for bikes because that is one of our goals when we go through these corridors is making sure that we're multimodal. Um, we wanna make sure that you know, we have safe uh, places for people to bike, walk, um, and, and travel no matter which means they, they choose. Um, but we also want to make sure that we have um, a system that connects into our existing bike path system so that individuals can um, not only just bike within a certain region, but be able to use that network throughout the entire city. So I hope that that answers um, from a project and from a more holistic view, um, but that's, those are the things that we're looking at. I think Marcus last time we had a comment on Saturday that there was five lanes of traffic. Um, <clears throat> currently, as it stands, the design only has three vehicle lanes of traffic on both Washington and Jefferson with the light rail um, with the light rail um, on the within those lanes. So we do have a very restricted right of way um, here. So taking we're trying to take as little as property as we build this light rail extension. So we actually went from four lanes of vehicle traffic to three. Um, so reducing that any further could have some significant impacts on the on the overall traffic on Washington and Jefferson. I think this question kind of goes along with what you um, gentlemen were just talking about in that. Is there any possibility of a dedicated bike lane coming out of these planning sessions? And that's that's what we're looking at. We're just we're, we're really restricted on 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 the on the amount of right of way we have to build this project. Um, like, like I mentioned, between 10th and 15th, we do have that dedicated lane, uh, but but we're already taking away, I think, Marcus, some dedicated uh, parking parking areas that were street parking. So we're already taking away from that to try to maximize our, our roadway and then fitting the light rail in there. But one thing I would like to add to that is that's why it's important <laughs> That uh, as we took this approach, that we not only took the approach of looking at the project, but also looking at the TOC, the transit oriented community, really making sure um, that 
suggestions like this can come to the, can bubble up to the top. Um, however, as we look at the project and as the project impacts Washington and Jefferson, we, if you look at the TOC area, it expands much further out um, from those corridors, which allows us to look at other opportunities to have some of these bike paths, maybe not necessarily on a Washington or a Jefferson. It may be on an Adams or a Madison, um, but and then connect to Washington and Jefferson at key locations. And so that's why it's important um, that we look at this holistically, um, because if there, if there are things that we cannot fit within the project, we can, uh, the project's not, is just not conducive to those things, we can look at the community as a whole and see, okay, where does it best fit? And if we can't put it into that envelope, then where can we place it to where it still provides that service, still provides a level of comfort, um, and, it's, and it's not done as an afterthought, that it's something that's done intentionally and done with the community. I see I do have a hand raised and I'm going to go over to Leticia. Leticia, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Just to build on that question, and I wasn't able to join the first half hour. So if you address this there, I apologize. But while you're thinking through adding bike lanes and other options, are you all also thinking through heat mitigation opportunities too, so that these options are actually usable throughout the year? The simple answer to that is yes, um, but I know that that seems uh, the, I just, that it seems too easy just to say it that way. So I'm, what I will say is this way: is that not only are we looking at the heat mitigation efforts that we're doing as part of the project itself, but when we look at the TLC, um, that gives us an opportunity. And I know Nick is still on. That gives us an opportunity to look at a wider region to to look at how do we connect. Right? We understand. That uh, last mile is always something that's not just why you're sitting at the bus stop or why you're sitting at the light rail platform. It's from the time that you leave your front door um, to the time that you get to those uh, amenities that we need to make sure that we have good, you know, coverage for uh, heat mitigation or heat respite um, through those corridors to get to those places of uh, investment. And so. Um, those are some of the things that we look at. Um, I can show you several examples of how the South Central um, transit oriented development community plan, how that was transformable and not only to the project itself, but to the greater uh, region and greater neighborhood and areas of, the, of that area um, that really talked about, you know, um, heat and heat mitigation me measures. And so um, I know Nick is on. I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that, Nick, but I, I tried to cover it as, as best as possible. And say it any better. Thanks, Marcus. All right. No problem. All right. If Central Avenue can go down to one lane in each direction, I think referencing South Central Extension, why do we need three lanes on Jefferson uh, on Washington Street and Jefferson Street? So, I guess I'll start and Tony, if you want to jump in, you can uh, help fill in any of the gaps that I may be missing um, with central Avenue. 1 of the, the things about central Avenue, um, we went down to 1 lane in each direction due to the fact that most of uh, the right of way along central Avenue is very tight. The buildings are built right adjacent to the back of sidewalk in most places. And we really wanted to make sure that um, that project did not lead to displacement of existing um, businesses and residents. We really wanted to make sure that we could ensure that the culture of South Phoenix and the land, the, the longstanding landmarks of South Phoenix um, were able to remain in place. Um, as we look at the Washington Jefferson for the capital extension, um, some of the things that have we, that we've looked at, um, especially being along that Washington uh, view corridor, um, the palm trees there are historic in nature. And so we are kind of limited also there in our footprint of, of what we can do. And as we look at the, that footprint, um, what we're really trying to do is make sure that um, not only do we provide for good uh, vehicular uh, traffic uh, through the area, but we also um, provide for good bike connectivity um, and then as well as bus and rail. Um, it's not that we're prioritizing one over the other because that is that's definitely not what we're trying to do. But what we are trying to do is make sure we have a corridor that truly is multimodal. 
um, we have to make sure that we don't uh, impact. Um, there are certain things that are that are um, from a M M MUTC um, standpoint. Um, there's certain things that <clears throat> we're kind of restricted on uh, as far as um, the degradation of intersections and the ability to move um, vehicles through. And when I say vehicles, that's not just uh, individual vehicles, um, but also um, light rail vehicles, as well as um, any other motorized vehicles, whether it be um, micro transit, um, scooters, bikes, things of that nature, as well as uh, pedal bikes. Um, and so, if you look at those corridors, a lot of times what we try to do is we try to maximize our sidewalk area, putting larger sidewalks, um, putting in as much vegetation as we possibly can that will provide shade canopies. Um, we normally will lose a lane of traffic whenever we put in. Most of the time, if you see wherever we, wherever we have placed rail, we have lost a lane of traffic. Um, here, um, we're not losing a lane of traffic, but we're losing parking. Um, and then we're also looking at um access to buildings and corridors so it's 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 not it's not a simple feat that our design team is is up against um they're really trying to make sure that we have something that all uh individuals can utilize and and see the enjoyment for it um but i just want to make sure it's very clear that we're not prioritizing the vehicular traffic we are definitely trying to um, make sure that we are incorporating in a safe manner um, a multimodal corridor for all of our transit corridors. Yeah, and I, I think I'll touch on it. I touched on it a little bit when I was talking about the environmental process. That is this this project because it is federally funded. Uh, one of those parts of the project that we have to analyze is traffic. If our traffic impacts to the existing traffic today are significantly worse or impacted, we have to come up with a mitigation and figure out a way to get around that. So, so the goal of these projects is not to build light rail and impact significantly other modes of transportation. So that's why it's a key to us to keep the traffic flow as good as possible with the level of service there that we're providing on Washington and Jefferson. And, and just to ch touch on that a little bit, Marcus, I think on Central, uh, one thing that we had there, so yes, we did close Central Avenue to vehicle traffic, but what we did as part of the South Central project, one of the mitigations was improving 7th Avenue and 7th Street on your commute from South Phoenix into downtown. So there's, we just, I don't know if we have that same opportunity here. Washington and Jefferson are very, very busy streets and very important streets to get in and out of downtown with folks that either have a choice to go to 7th Avenue to the I-10 or head, uh, head down Washington to get to the I-17 truck route. And, and a lot of folks use that today. And that will be shown in our in traffic analysis um, study that we have here later this year. Thank you, Tony, and thank you, Marcus. All right, we have about five minutes left in our broadcast today. So if you have any last minute burning questions, please raise your hand or go ahead and put it in the Q&A. I have one question from Pat and also a comment, I believe. I'm going to read the comment, which is, Sharrows are not bike lanes and are not consistent with the FHWA facility type selection tool. If the bike lanes have to be removed, they need to be replaced with a functionally equivalent facility. And uh, here's Pat's question. Speaking of first last mile access, what kind of bike parking and bike share will be available at station? What kind of bike path access will be available to the station? So what, and, and the light rail is uh, bike friendly. So we do have that uh, opportunity to put bikes on our vehicles. So we do, like Marcus said, we're in the early stages of design, but our goal is always to get folks that are either walking, biking to our stations and we'll make sure we, we accommodate, accommodate that on, on all of our platforms. And then as far as with the bike lanes, um, I do understand the concerns with Sherrall's. Um, I do want to be clear though, um, right now, Washington and Jefferson do not existently have bike lanes. Um, we are looking to incorporate bike lanes and, um, and I think there's a section of it further west that does, but I know from our stretch from 3rd Avenue over to 7th, I know that's and I can pull up the aerial to see if it has bike lanes further west than that. But I know um, we do not have bike lanes in those areas. And so we're, we're, we're trying to incorporate and, and bring into 
um, this corridor a, a safe travel pattern and safe traveling. And so I understand that Sherrall's, um, I have, I do ride every once in a while, and I do know that Sherrall's are not uh, preferred uh, from the biking community. Um, that's one of the things that we brought up the importance of the TOC is looking at there may be opportunities um, to use alternative. Um, lanes or alternative areas such as like Adams or Madison um, and then make those connections. Um, then also due to our design um, as the design moves forward, um, uh, you may have some share that are not as what you would think are your typical share -alls. Like We have what are called slip lanes. Um, sometimes when we have a center running track, we'll have slip lanes, which they have very low volume of pedestrian of vehicular traffic. And really, uh, the main focus of those is to allow um, access um, to properties. Um, it's not really created for the, the mass uh, thorough view of, of traffic that are going through those corridors. It's really to provide that access. And so they have uh, significantly lower amounts of vehicular traffic on those. And sometimes, um, depending on how the design lays out, we're able to utilize those, which those are normally, since they are slip lane, they're buffered um, by rail on one side, uh, curb gutter on the other. Um, you do have uh, vehicular traffic that can follow through in that in those areas. Um, however, you, you kind of get better separation from um, the higher speed traffic that goes through those corridors. Thank you, Marcus. Yeah, and just to oh. clarify too on the FHWA, so on this project, we'll be following, we follow the FTA, um, not the FHWA, but um, we do have to meet the city of Phoenix local requirements, which are typically more stringent than any FTA or FHWA. So I um, just wanted to clarify that. <clears throat> Thank you, Tony. All right, we're at 12.59, so I'm going to wrap us up here. But thank you everyone who wrote in a comment, who had questions, who raised their hand. We really do need your input, and that is how we're going to continue to shape the light rail extension uh, for Capital District, as well as the you know, community around the, around the light rail. Uh, so again, you can fill out the comment form anytime. So if you want to take a moment and think about the presentation today, or if you didn't have a time to see the first half of the presentation, we will be making the recording available to you. Uh, that will be posted online at valleymetro.org slash capex. You can fill out the comment form anytime before June 7th. And again, we do have uh, some additional workshops coming up for the Transit Oriented Communities Project. Those are going to be tomorrow and Wednesday. I will note that also Wednesday is going to be a Spanish interpret uh, Spanish led. So it'll be conducted in Spanish uh, on Wednesday, May 22nd for both sessions. There will be English interpretation available uh, if you can only attend on Wednesday. Thank you all for coming out and we appreciate your time. Um, have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>